update everyone's bios a little bit here, but there's so much more information um, just because I really want us to get to the conversation. Um, Dr. Waller's here, I saw him. There he is, Dr. Stephen Waller. Hello, wave for everybody. Uh, he is also a member of the uh, Diversity and Aquatics Research Committee. Um, he's a professor and associate department head of Re recreation and sports management at the Uni University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Um, and his research interests include religious socialization as a constraint to recreation and sport participation, as well as structural barriers to career advancement for minorities and women in recreation and sport organizations. Um, this man has a billion degrees. He's been through a lot of education. Um, but I will tell you that he got his PhD at Michigan State University Parks and Recreation Administration. And then he also has a Master's of Divinity and a Doctor of Ministry as well, showing how this is the intersect of where he is really interested. So that would be Dr. Waller there uh, in the lovely blue top there in his office, I believe. Um, and then I want to move on to Dr. Angela Beal Tafik. Uh, she, for direct, uh, diversity in aquatics, is the director of education and research. She's also the associate professor of health, physical education, and teacher education. Uh, she's the chair of the Department of Science, Technology, Education, Arts, Mathematics, and Movement Education in the College of Education at Rowan University in New Jersey. Uh, she has also been swimming for a very long time, starting off with PDR in Philadelphia, and then also swam at, again, a really awesome university called Howard University in Washington, DC. Uh, she has a BA in English from Howard, a master's from Howard, and her PhD she earned at the Florida State University in physical education, teacher education. Dr. Beal, I saw you, you're in here. Wave when you get it. There she is. That's Dr. Beal, awesome. All right, and the last person I want to introduce right now is Thaddeus Gamery who I don't see, but I'm hoping you're here. I don't see you, Thaddeus, but I only think I have a little partial window here. here. But he's the founder of Mind Body Aquatics. Uh, he's faculty at the Center for Mind Body Medicine. Uh, he is the director of community engagement and programs for diversity in aquatics. Really interesting to have him here as well because he's also a retired lieutenant with the New York Police Department. Um, he's also a member of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. Uh, he holds several lifeguard instructor coach certifications, uh, and he holds a BA in public and government administration from the John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and he's a head coach for Diversity in Aquatics, Master Swim, and Triathlon Clubs. Uh, Thaddeus, I know that you're here, and I actually want to uh, toss to you now so that you can have a, a moment here to get us all prepared, our mind and body prepared for this conversation. So Thaddeus? Thank you, Stephanie. Can everyone hear me? I'm coming in clear? Sure. Okay. Sounds great. All right. So we're going to take a moment to become present and mindful. And today we're going to practice one simple meditation called soft belly breathing, which is one of the many forms of meditation aimed at inviting ourselves to enter a state of relaxed awareness. So if you can sit up straight, put your feet floor. Your hands are either on your laps with the palms up or palms down, but ideally you shouldn't be crossed. And then settle into a relaxed position with your eyes closed, if you like, or looking down with a slight gaze to minimize distraction. Now, bring your attention to your breathing as it is right now. Doing nothing special, and just notice your breath. Next, I'd like you to take a deep breath in your nose and exhale out your mouth. Inhale through your nose and exhale out your mouth. Continue breathing in your nose and out your mouth, bringing a deeper awareness and relax relaxation intention to your breathing. As you breathe in your nose and out your mouth, you can become even more aware of the depth and quality of your breathing by placing one hand on your belly 
and with each inhalation, feel it rise. And with each exhalation, feel it fall. Now there's one caveat, if you're driving, please keep your eyes open and your attention on the road, but you can engage in soft belly breathing anytime and anywhere. To encourage an even deeper sense of breathing and going into this process, you can say to yourself soft as you breathe in and belly as you breathe out. Breathe in soft, exhale belly. Soft, belly. Continue breathing and if thoughts come, let them come and let them go. Gently bringing your mind back to soft belly, soft belly. When your belly is soft and relaxed, more air goes to the bottom of the lungs where there is better oxygen exchange. Oxygen feeds all the cells in your body, improves your metabolism. And when the belly is soft and relaxed, it helps to activate the vagus nerve, which wanders up from the belly through the chest to the central nervous system to the brain. It quiets the body, slows the heart rate, improves digestion, lowers blood pressure, helps muscle relax. It also quiets the mind. This activity in the part of the emotional brain that registers fear and anger. Continue to breathe with a soft belly. And if there's any distractions that come as they will, let them come and let them go and bring your attention back to soft belly, soft belly. When we're breathing slowly and deeply like this, we're act activating areas of the brain responsible for self-awareness, thoughtful decision-making and compassion, making it easier to bond with other people. When you breathe slowly and deeply, you feel more buoyant, less heavy on land as well as in water. Breathing can allow you to see where you are resisting, resisting the flow of your process. Breathing can allow you to feel supported Breathing also allows what I like to call a vital peace. A vital peace that when we're focused on our breath, we create a space. And as Viktor Frankl said, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. Take a few more breaths as we begin to close this soft belly mindfulness moment. Open your eyes slowly, wiggle your fingers and toes stretch if you need it or like and thank you for letting me share that practice with you thank you thaddeus now everyone's open-minded and relaxed and ready to have a great conversation <laughs> that's great all right i want to uh bring forth
I don't know, normally I would bring them to the podium, but I would like to bring forth uh, Miriam Lynch so she can give us a little bit more information about uh, diversity in aquatics and also to talk a little bit about uh, diversity in aquatics statement when it comes to this intersectionality uh, that we're all here to discuss. Miriam? Um, first of all, thank you all. Um, and thank you, uh, Stephanie, for being here. And thank you all for being a part of this. Um, one of the important parts of for us is diversity in aquatics. We are a network of 1,700 members, and uh, we have maxed out um, our Zoom for today <laughs> of numbers of people who are participating in that. So I thank you guys for being a part of it. Please know if you have coworkers, um, I will give this side note, coworkers who are trying to get in, we are recording this today so that we will have access to this ongoing uh, topic because it doesn't stop here. Um, that is the one thing for us at Diversity in Aquatics. When we saw what was happening, this is, um, it mirrors what we are working on as an organization is that before we get to talk about the opportunities in aquatics, we must address the things that have been oppressive um, on our communities in this field. So that's where we have, we have made our statement. Um, and COVID-19 has really taken a reveal to um, the disparities that we see in health in education, but is all also mirrored here in the aquatic space. Um, we know that there are certain barriers that have um, prevented equal access and participation in this space. And for us as an organization, this is what we are constantly working on, is working with community groups, working with aquatic agencies, working with individuals and with athletes um, to really combat the underlying um, causes to the disparities that we find in this aquatic field. Um, we know that it is a systemic um, issue. It's not a singular issue. Um, too long aquatics has been a part of the social justice um, and um, this social justice space. Um, you know, the famous um, Red Summer in Chicago um, in 1921, when the young gentleman um, was swimming in Lake Michigan, and when he crossed the segregation line, was stoned um, in Lake Michigan and drowned, which caused uh, the riots, uprise of riots in Chicago. We know that drowning has been caused for many um, things of fear, drowning to show um, power, to show um, policies have been passed, to not have equal access to the resources in our communities, which we are still feeling the ripple effects for today. Um, and so that is why we bring up this topic. This is something that we are constantly a part of, um, but it is also something that um, we must use what we have now to help go forward. And that's why we're having this discussion today. I'm so pleased to be joined by a circle of different um, experts that, are, that have done research in this field, but not only research, but they're practitioners. Each of one of us is part of Diversity in Aquatics. We are a 100% volunteer-based organization. Um, we all come from uh, different backgrounds and different fields into this space to work on these issues together. And this is uh, a forum to start uh, more dialogue together um, to work on um, addressing these issues that we are bringing up today. Um, I'm pleased to say that Diversity in Aquatics, we are on our second um, version of the Ajari Journal, which has been led by uh, Dr. Angela Beal and Dr. Stephen Waller. Um, we've also reached within our, within our network um, a million people with the message of water safety on International Water Safety Day. Um, we have also done a number of things, as you've heard from Stephanie, that talked about us having um, a master swim club um, down in Florida that Thaddeus heads up. Um, that is working with addressing adults before they get into the water, the traumas and the fears um, that may be existing. Um, and so doing a great job with that. And then we also have Dr. Shira Allen, who's a part of our HBCU network, um, which we have multiple programs with HBCUs across the country that work on creating lifeguard um, and water safety instructor training. Um, so know that being a part of this does not start, stop here. It goes beyond um, this session, and we'll talk more about this. But I want to say this too, is the funds that you have contributed um, are going directly to us doing the work in the communities in which are needed. Um, the funds we are, we are pushing towards our diversity and aquatics master's program so that more adults 
have the chance to learn how to swim. The funds that you have donated are going towards bringing awareness on International Water Safety Day. And the funds that you are uh, bringing to the, um, our organization are also going back into the communities through our aquatic councils. So I thank you for being a part of this. I thank you for your cause, your passion for this, and we continue to evolve and grow, but we need your help um, to continue on. So thank you all and look forward to this discussion. So thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Miriam. All right, so, so for us to have this discussion, one of the things that we want to do is talk a little bit about where we are right now. Like, so basically, what are the statistics that really help us paint this picture very clearly why there needs to be a focus on diversity in aquatics and water safety? And for that, I want to go to Dr. Beal. Um, Angela, can you please put into perspective here what the drowning rates are for black and brown people compared to say white folks? You're still muted, Beal. Beal. <laughs> this is too much. It's there you go. There you go. Now we hear you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Well, first and foremost, thank you so much um, for coming. And one of the things that I want us to understand is that drowning, um, number one, is the number one, as we said, the number one neglected public health threat. Um, and as we look at it in the United States, we do know, and, and a lot of us are, are, are very familiar because you guys are out there doing the work, um, it, it's about, I mean, African Americans drown about nine times higher the rate in terms of the overall disparity. And that, and that's, directly attributed um, to us. But one of the things that this is even more important and relevant is because globally, it is also a neglected public health threat. And when we're talking about it that way, it's important to understand that even globally, and then as we centralize it to the United States, it's impacting diverse or indigenous populations with that same disparity. And when we're looking at it through the lens, it's important, and here at Diversity in Aquatics, we understand that before you can get to rowing or, or, or the Olympics or, or anything, you have to understand and be aware of really the power of water. So when you're also looking at that in the United States, drowning or, uh, is actually listed under Consumer Products Commission and that impacts policies. And we, are un we understand collectively that policies are impacted by public health. And if we don't look at aquatics or learning to swim or drowning through that lens, it does not truly hit at what we are looking at, such as factors of social justice or factors of inequity or factors of public health. And so as a health and physical educator and in going into public health, it's important, especially when you're talking about diverse populations, diverse populations, whether you're talking about diverse in terms of physical, mental, social, emotional ability. If, you're, if you look at diversity through the lens of gender base or, or any kind of element, when you're talking about that specifically to African-American children and youth, it also is disproportionately Im um, impacted. And there's documented literature that talks about how uh, educational systems are impacted, public health care systems are impacted. And there's a work in a piece right now, if you want to look at the state that we're in, um, our letter actually talked about the state of the American uh, Public Health Association. It talks about the idea of structural violence and how in, in this, Paul Farmer, uh, in, in terms of this text, it really looks at how human rights uh, violations can really be built into structures of communities and, and this can impact access, inequities, healthcare. And if we don't, aren't aware of those factors, and that's what we're talking about now, it's not just about Black Lives Matter, it does. But what we're talking about is the impact of social determinants, social ills, the structures within that create barriers to healthcare, to facilities, to knowledge bases across the board, and then the stereotypes, the policies that are actually intertwined to systemically continue really the, the inability and spread of information that can impact the drowning rate in our communities. That really helps us understand why this is so important. And 
for anyone who's here, if you have a question, feel free to post it. We'll get it. I'll ask it. I don't want to necessarily wait for all the questions. If there's something right now that's present in your mind, let me know and let us know and we will chat it into the, type it into the chat and then we'll get around to it. They'll, they'll flag me and tell me to take a look. Um, so one of the things that I constantly think about too is sort of this idea of generational trauma. The idea that perhaps you didn't have anything happen to you about a fear of water, but maybe it happened to your grandparents and then that got passed down and then you're afraid because your grandparents are afraid and then so no one in your family learned how to swim. So this idea is really prevalent in a lot of black American families. And for that historical context, Dr. Waller, if you could speak to that uh, first, just a little bit here about that context and how that is specific to what we see here uh, in uh, American culture. You're muted. <laughs> All right, Dr. Beal, you're supposed to tell me that I'm mute. Happened to you, wasn't supposed to happen to me. But, but uh, as Dr. Beal was uh, speaking earlier, um, one of the things that I was thinking about was an incident that happened to me when I was a, a child. Um, again, I grew up in Flint, Michigan, actually, believe it or not. And of course, um, everybody knows about the water crisis there. Uh, but one of the things that I was painfully aware of were the narratives in my family. Uh, my father came out of Virginia, uh, my mother out of Kansas. And what was interesting is there was a strange silence uh, when it came down to swimming. Uh, I was encouraged to play baseball, play basketball, uh, to participate in wrestling and other sorts of uh, sport-related activities during the summers, but no one ever encouraged me to learn to swim. Um, later on, as I began probing, namely with my with both sets of grandparents. Um, what I discovered was that the, I had relatives in Virginia that were drowned. Uh, some of you may know where Danville, Virginia is, uh, if you're from Virginia. Um, you know, and as a matter of fact, if you watch the third installment of Roots, um, one of the interesting places they talk about is the Waller Plantation, uh, which actually used to stand out on 29 in Danville. And one of the ways that they would punish their slaves uh, was to drown them. And so on my dad's side of the family, uh, no one was ever encouraged to get in the water. Uh, on my mom's side of the family, again, which came out of Kansas, namely Topeka, Wichita, El Dorado, um, they were not swimmers either. As a matter of fact, uh, part of the crazy narrative that emerged from that side of my family was that uh, black people were too heavy and that we were quote unquote weighty. And if we got into the lake or if we got into swimming pools, we would suddenly sink to the bottom. You know, what was interesting was, you know, if you hear that enough times, you begin to believe it, but also internalize it. Um, I had the good fortune of going to an undergraduate school in Michigan uh, in which the state mandated that everybody had to take at least one semester of swimming. And you had to demonstrate competency before you were able to graduate. And trust me, uh, a number of my buddies, I played football in college and a number of my buddies got held up at the end because they had not passed beginning swimming. But it also turned out to be a lifesaver. Uh, for example, a good friend of mine, followed by the name of Steve Thompson, uh, was our quarterback my sophomore year in college. Uh, one summer, he and another teammate went out on the Huron River near Ann Arbor, Michigan. And uh, with a six pack of beer and just kind of paddling along, uh, John Thomas, my other teammate, fell out of the boat. Unfortunately, uh, he had signed up for beginning swimming in the fall semester. He drowned in the Huron River, where Steve Thompson had taken swimming the prior semester. 
But again, one of JT's fears was again, drowning by sinking. And so we have all these false narratives, um, again, that begin at the family level. Um, certainly, many of them emanate from slavery. But I think that, again, if we're going to begin to chip away at this pervasive problem in communities of color, namely the black community, uh, it's got to start at home um, to really begin to unravel a lot of these stereotypical and simply false narratives. The other thing that I would suggest is that, um, and again, this is another personal experience in another life, I spent 25 years as an executive in government, uh, specifically working as a director of parks and recreation in five different communities uh, across the country. Um, one of the big narratives was African Americans don't necessarily swim, so therefore we don't need to as we plan, uh, as we think about renovating uh, communities, we don't necessarily need to build aquatic facilities and complexes. Uh, we will inundate those communities with baseball fields, football stadiums, basketball courts, so on and so forth. Um, and for many, many years, regardless of what the national standards, namely by the National Recreation and Parks Association and the American Society for Landscape Architecture, uh, no matter what those standards espouse, often appointed and legislative officials uh, would do otherwise. So we get an, an overabundance of certain types of facilities and simply we either knock down swimming pools or never really built them at all. So again, we are uh, not providing sufficient levels of opportunity uh, for people to, to learn to swim. Uh, but again, stereotypes, prejudicial attitudes, about swimming in communities of color um, have been pervasive, and I would argue that they're still there. And again, as we move further into the conversation, uh, I'll talk about my interest in advocacy, uh, really applying policy and legal remedies uh, to really address some of these types of problems. Thank you, Dr. Waller. I'm just curious, just by nodding your heads, how many people like in your towns, wherever you live, they're like, all the pools are concentrated on one part of town and they're not in parts where there are people of color. Is that often where it is? I live in Los Angeles where I am and you would think that we'd have pools everywhere and it's really not quite the case. So I just think that's something that we can all tangibly think of wherever we are and, and know that that is the case. Um, Thaddeus, I know you've spoken to us a bit. I'm curious to hear from you on this topic simply because you have a, an interesting intersection because not only you are you a swimmer, but you are also part of NYPD. So you have this interesting intersection of seeing all of what we are going through right now through a very different lens um, and how that plays into what you've seen um, from your time in New York and being a, a lieutenant in the police department. So do you want to speak to that right now? Uh, sure. Um... It is a very distressing time, and, and thank you um, for the question. A very distressing time. And um, part of my experience of being in the New York City Police Department, what allowed me to actually persevere and, and almost survive it, if you will, was that I was swimming and that I had a connection to water. And there were many things that were upsetting, and the, it, was, it was woven into the fabric of the uh, of the organization, it was part of the culture, and you couldn't get away get away with uh, from it. So uh, my escape was quite often into the water. Um, and actually, when I came to Florida, I actually did not. I wanted to distance myself from law enforcement. I wanted to recreate myself as this the coach, the triathlete, the uh, scuba diver. I wanted to be the mindful qigong instructor, and I didn't want any much to do with uh, law enforcement anymore, except to use what I learned to help, to contribute. Because I was a, a, a New York City public school mentor for kids at risk while I was in the NYPD. Um, I tried to do my part um, while I was there. And recently, with all that's going on, um, you know, I'm called uh, back into uh, action to, to, to contribute, to support. And I see that water plays 
could play and should play and, and, and hopefully will play a significant role in, in, in assisting us through these times. Because besides breath, which all of us need to live, and breath is significant in this moment, right? The loss of breath. Besides breath that we need to live, we all need water. We are connected by water. We are water. We are 60% water. The planet is 70% water. Our brain is somewhere near 75, 80% water. And the historical reality of law enforcement and the relationship to people, black people in particular, people of color also, losing a relationship with waters, the law enforcement was used as a tool of to, to, to keep the segregation, to enforce it, or to stand by and allow white mobs to take action and to chase and instill fear. The, also the truth is about water is that the reality of the history of, of swimming, when you take it in its totality, is the Africans were considered the greatest swimmers in the world at one time. That the tradition of swimming is something that was inherent in all black and brown people throughout the diaspora. Native Americans as well had a swimming tradition. So when you lose water, you lose another resource for health, healing. You lose another tradition and custom. And I'm, I'm hopeful because I, I have presented something called the Blue Mind to the National Organization of law, Black Law Enforcement Executives to use water and, and, and recapturing a, a water as the place of healing and, wetis, and medicine and wellness or to see water as medicine, actually to see, to imagine water as medicine, because it, it, it actually is. So to, to um, help to mitigate the stress of the job, because a stressed out officer, an officer that's dealing with unresolved PTSD, an officer that is, is hypervigilant and fearful, they're more likely to hurt people. So if, the, uh, if I have anything to do with it, and, I, and hopefully I will, um, I'm going to introduce this something called the Blue Mindfulness Training to law enforcement. Um, I'm waiting to present to uh, the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives again and now. And, um, you know, the use of uh, the tools of mindfulness and the healing benefits of the water to reduce stress, to feel more connected, to feel more compassion, to feel more empathy for self and for others. Thaddeus, I love what you just said about breath because that's been such a focal point since May 25th, again, in this country, talking about I can't breathe and the need for breath and how vital that is to life. But what you just connected to was also the water, which we also need. And that is sort of a new element there that we haven't really heard. And I think that's a really good way to look at that. And to take us to, so we've looked at the context of why we are in the state that we are in here in the United States, as far as how black people have reacted to the water over the decades in this, in this country. I want to talk a little bit now about where do we go next? And Anna Summerfield, this is to your question. Anna's, Anna's question is, what can local swim club organizations do to break down barriers and work with black families to get involved in swimming? And so this is where I want to bring in Dr. Ashira Allen because she has been looking at this and studying this and is really versed on the idea of how to get more black people involved. And you know, we realize there are a lot of people out there that want to get black and brown people involved, but just don't know how to do it. And that we're so happy you're here because that's what we want to talk about. So uh, Ashira, if you could talk a, a bit about where do we go next? What's needed? How can people be actively getting more people of color into the water? 
Hey everyone, um, I'm glad you all are here. Um, so from my experience and perspective and being involved with research, I think that we have to um, increase the perspective and value, like that people's value of, of um, engaging in aquatic activity in the water. And a lot of times I, th I see organizations, they'll be like, well, I'm gonna have free or I'll have free swim lessons. Um, I've opened up the pool to, you know, this dem demographic of people, and then they may not get the response that um, they're looking for. Um, this is just one example. And there are other, I think, issues that come into play that, that people don't generally think about um, that may be barriers to them um, even thinking and valuing the water um, in that way and participating in aquatic activities. Um, and so that's one thing that I think about. And also representation, that's why I started the Black Girl Swim blog to show people um, not only, you know, uh, there are swimmers um, at an elite level that we see Simone Manuel and Cullen Jones, but there are swimmers like me who swim for recreationally and enjoy swimming and other aquatic activities just on a regular basis, just, you know, intrinsically loving to do it. Um, and so for me, my, you know, I, I love swimming and love the water from a very early age. Um, my parents, they are really avid swimmers. Um, my dad didn't learn how to swim until he was like 19 years old at Tuskegee University um, at the pool. And my mom, she will not go past five feet. And so, um, but they encouraged me and encouraged my um, interest in the water and so when i was in grad school and i was like i i want to see i don't see a lot of representation on social media social media was getting really big then you know it was like it's at its infancy and um i decided to start the blog and just show people my side and my experience um just as a regular person not an elite athlete you know i didn't swim on a co collegiate level like many of you all, but I swam competitively in high school, and that's a lot of people's stories. And I think um, just showing that, um, that I can be relate, I can be relatable, right? And I can, there are people out there like me. Because honestly, I, I, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, and it was a lot of black people that swam in my circle. And so once I got outside of that circle, People would come up, you know, black people don't swim, black people don't swim. I'm like, uh, I was on a whole black swim team back at home. And so when I got outside of that bubble, you know, I realized that there is a problem. There is, you know, there are issues with this. And I think that representation matters um, and that you don't have to necessarily be on, like, to reach that elite level, but just learning how to swim, knowing that it's a, necessary and life skill that's very important to you know and it opens up your your whole world you know for swimming for me it didn't it it expanded my horizons you know i wasn't afraid i'm not afraid to i've traveled abroad and i've gone to beaches in malawi and i've you know i've been places and so i've seen other people that i've tried to encourage black people they won't even step a foot step foot in on off the beach and I'm like, come on, you know, and people have seen me and they're like, oh my gosh, you are a black lady who knows how to swim. This is awesome. You know, how can I get, you know, so that's, I think seeing other people do it and it's not necessarily on that elite level. Like I don't have to strive to be an Olympian, but I, I'm, I just, I'm seeing a regular person, man, woman, child, and they can swim laps, you know, or they can hold their breath underwater. Oh, she's not afraid to get her hair wet. She's a black woman. Oh my gosh. You know, so um that's part of that historical context. That's huh? part that, that's part of that historical context. Like, yeah. oh, black people want to get their hair wet and all of that. And and Ashira, just to your point about what you're talking about, you just enjoy the water. Like that's yes, and then yeah. Happy, right. And so, like, I'm one of six kids. We all grew up swimming. My brother right above me played water polo and swam. And the kids in the family, the next generation, they all call him Uncle Fish because he was always in the water. My family, yeah. literally, he is known as Uncle Fish. And 
I don't think people think we're weird because that is so normal, right? Like yeah. to us, that's normal. And that's to your point. And I want to make sure, and, and Anna, if you want to unmute yourself to ask the question yourself, because I see you have a very specific question about local swim club organizations, because, because I can, Beal is here, Dr. Beal. Okay, so I will be honest. Angela Beal and I were on the swim team together in college. She's one of my best friends. I've known her since 1904. That's my year today. I don't know why. Nice. <laughs> I call her Beal. Um, but Anna, if you want to unmute yourself and literally ask this question so that um, Angela can answer you, I, I really do want to hear from you. Thank you, um, Stephanie. So one of the things that our LSC, we, we call ourselves LSC, is trying to look at is how do we bridge the gap? We, we have several um, black swimmers, lots of black swimmers in our LSC, but not as many as I think we should have. And I think our black swimmers are feeling somewhat ostracized or um, sometimes even um, not welcome on pool decks. And that's not their fault, but we have that situation. And I don't know how to overcome some of those barriers where black swimmers feel welcome, where they um, don't get booed when they win a race or when a parent doesn't make a comment, oh, you can't let that black swimmer beat you. How do we overcome that? How do we talk to the kids? How do we do that on competitive swim teams? That's where my venue is. How do we do that? Okay, that's me. Okay, so, am I off mute? Hi. Well, one of the things um, that I definitely would recommend, and as I think as, as Dr. Allen and as what we're hearing is, um, there is no one solution. So number one, don't look to resolve that problem and, and make that what the, pro you know, make that specific to and central to the, to the factor. I mean, I think one of the things that it's important we understand is, um, that what you'll hear is a multi-sectoral approach is needed. That is why diversity in aquatics is here. That is, is how we see it. Oftentimes, and what you hear now, um, in this state, how many of you, a, a sign of, you know, of, of thumbs, how many of you may have called, it, it called a friend? If, you weren't, if you're not uh, um, African-American, Hispanic, Latino, or diverse, how many of you, if you are, our, our you know, white American called a black friend immediately when you saw what happened because you're trying to figure it out. Show a thumbs. Really, a hand. Because, it, and, and the reality is what we're talking about is the, the sin of our nation in terms of slavery that we, none of us can figure it out, right? So, you're, so you, to, to say that what I'm trying to do is get black swimmers to not feel what is a part of the social fabric? You can't speak for everyone else. You shouldn't look to solve the problem of everyone else. But what communities across the board, one of the things that we're saying is it's important to make it a part of the community. So not starting just with the swimmers you have, but looking at the possibilities of really showing the diversity or the care that is really taken to the sport in the community around you. And then to have that also become a part of the fabric. So it's not just about competitive swimming because many, there are many stories about how to get to a pool might be circumvented really by engagement in, in, your own, in their own neighborhoods. And, and we're also talking about different socioeconomic status. You have to understand that. If you're talking about competitive swimming, there is a socioeconomic status that's affiliated with that. So in that element, it's really, how can you show a dedication to the community and then build and create and weave that fabric into your competitive swimming program and then build and weave that fabric into your actual program? How are families involved or are you just engaging the swimmer? How many, how many events or, or activities or team building? One of the things that um, in terms of, of our work, 
working together in communities is actually going into communities and building, whether it's mentoring opportunities, with, where the team, for example, looks at sharing the importance of water safety in a community. Are there activities like that that are just as important to building character? Because you talked about two things there. You talked about parents being, being negative. I know that story very well. You're talking about not being able to control going into a locker room and having a parent in a final you know, element say to their kid, I don't care if you beat anyone, but just beat that one. Those are, those are not one type of, of, of story. There are probably many that you have experienced, but one of the things that I would promote and we discuss in diversity and aquatics is really the importance of having to do deep things differently when you're engaging diverse communities. When you look at cultural competency, cultural pedagogy, culture, respecting culture, means that you're also engaging and understanding how children relate to adults and families. For example, in some Asian cultures, the idea of honor, of looking at someone directly in the eyes, is not, that's a sign, maybe a sign of disrespect. Whereas in the African-American culture, I'm telling you, look at me when I'm talking to you. If you have a coach who absolutely isn't aware of any of that, and you come and you have children who, for example, are very used to speaking their thoughts in words. However, culturally, you don't speak if you're not spoken to. Those are, those are interwoven values of a community. So to understand that most of the time, in whether it's you know globally, when you, when we're engaging each other in aquatics, you understand that you are be you are because of the systemic nature of the sport or just the activity, how it has been structured, right? Because the history, knowing the history, the history of aquatics is that it was not separated by race initially. Pools, bathhouse, Philadelphia, in North Philadelphia, born and raised is the swimming pool is where I spent most of my days. The history here is that pools were built for working class America to get clean. They weren't built for swimming, but it was a, built, a gathering bathhouse. So the purpose was not built on race at first. However, with the development of the pool, then it became a social scene. So those are factors that when we're talking about at diversity and aquatic about the history that plays a part before we even get to competitive swimming, knowing the history of your swimmers and showing that you have, there's a respect within the real structure is also, that's just a minor tip of the iceberg. So when I say don't feel like you have to conquer the world, but you are right now beginning the conversation and like babies in this whole relationship, all of us together, it's about learning to walk. When you look at this moment in time in history, the empathy for the first time to acknowledge something that we know has always existed, that's a first. If you talk to my grandmother, 100 years, my mother, the 60s, right? If I talk to my colleagues, Dr. Lydia, people are saying, this is different. Because there is a certain awareness. So don't feel like you have to rush and solve it. But I would start with the question of how can we work together to build, to get to the competitive swimming pool? What things could we do? Do you do community service in your competitive swimming program? What is character? Character building is one of the big things that I work with students. Character. When you're talking about respect what does that mean so those are some of the things when we're, we're talking and engaging and saying what's really important to look at values how can you do things differently thank you i think i think a huge part of it too that we've seen in the country is that people are afraid to talk about these things because they're afraid they're going to say the wrong thing and you're right, because I've been out in the middle of these protests all over the place here. I can tell you this is different. There are people of all walks of life showing up to these protests. This is different. It is different. I was in Ferguson for almost two and a half months. 
this is different. The way people are responding are different. People are trying to figure it out and that gives us an opportunity. And so I think part of it is team building, right? You need that team building so that people respect their fellow teammate, their coach, all these different places that they're coming from. And as Shira, you, you wrote in here, and I just want to go back to you quickly about this, is part of changing that culture is also building that respect for the team, right? Yes, I was just, listen, I would agree with everything Dr. Bill said, like the, it's, and it's, there, it's, it's all interrelated and you can see and these things mirrored and just in our society in general, like we have to, it's a cultural shift that has to happen, like a cultural change that has to happen. These things are so deeply ingrained within our society, within America, within, you know, family, like it's just, it's, it's here. And so to, to, we have to, again, I think I definitely 100% what Dr. Bill said, start from, you know, that personal relationship with your swimmers, you know, uh, having a converse, having conversations with their parents um, uh, and seeing, you know, and understanding what their world looks like, not only, you know, on the pool deck, but when they're going home, like I've been in, you know, many situations where, you know, it might appear to be all great on the outside or when, when you see them there, but then it's some things going on, um, at home or in their neighborhood or, you know, that you may not be aware of or may not be able to even fathom. Um, and so I think really putting forth an effort to understand um, because again, cult our cultural backgrounds and things that we go through are, you know, a lot of things are different. I think even understanding that socioeconomic piece is very big, you know, the swimming is expensive and, you know, the cost of a swimsuit, the fees to join the swim team. And, you know, the, if you look at the wealth gap in America and you can just see like, well, like we, you know, we don't have black people, black Americans I'm talking about, don't really have any wealth, like a very small amount. And so where does that money go? How can I sustain this? You know, um, if they drop off and aren't able to pay something, if they aren't able to come to this event, if they, you know, what can, what can happen or, or how can we gain understanding, empathy, you know, towards, you know, that group of individuals and really, really being genuine about it because people can feel your energy. They can feel whether or not you're genuine or not. And so that's, I think that's very important. Um, and also being, addressing the, the racism and the, uh, those remarks that are being said, like, yeah. right, right, when it's happening and being like, look, we're not tolerating that on my team, where we are, you know, and you may lose some parents, you may, I don't know, but again, that comes with that cultural shift that needs to happen. Um, yes, yeah. so, yeah. setting those boundaries, right? Setting those boundaries and say, this is, this is how we speak swim here, right? And that's not part of our culture. Our culture is this. And we're moving forward. And if you can't be a part of it, it's unfortunate because we value this in the language we commonly speak, right? So it's about setting those, those basic parameters of how you're gonna operate. Um, Miriam, I have another question here that uh, is about, uh, as a member of my local LSC board, and Lamar, I don't see you right now. So I'm looking to see if you're, do I see you? Lamar, 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 Lamar. I have to go through a lot of pages because there's a lot of people here. Because if you wanted to ask the question yourself, I'm more than happy for you to do it. Um, but one of the things that I think that we, it is a very good question, is about, to the points that you're all speaking about, is having that engagement of your people, the parents, everyone, who want to get them there, but getting them on boards, getting them participating yeah. there, being there at meetings, yeah. making them feel that they're welcomed and wanted to be participating in this. So Miriam, what do you say to that question? No, that's exactly it. Are you creating space? Are you creating space? Does your parent, if you're a parent run or like board, does, is there a space for parents to be involved um, in the decision-making into the values of your organization? What we find in aquatics is that it 
when we're trying to address certain communities, we don't have certain communities at that table to help make the decisions and be the gatekeepers and the bridge makers and the advocates and the learning and the teachers and the education and the providers into that space. Now, I will tell you this, it does not just one person. It's not a checkpoint, right? It's not like, oh, you, you are the, the all, but it's a start. Um, and as the two said um, previously, Dr. Allen and uh, Dr. Beal, is that it starts too with relationship building um, on your team. It is putting those boundaries and building relationships that what are our current values and for us to treat enough one another so that not only is that a system of the team, but when a, a child or an athlete or an adult is in a space where there is going to be that kind of interaction that might cause friction, that the team is a part of a collective um, communication in that spot, right? Um, that the team is a part of, nope, we don't do that here, as Stephanie says, that's not part of us. You need to leave our team area. This is who we stand for, because that puts the value, not only just that the person, it's a whole community behind that. Um, and it, it, that's the start of it. It's the start of creating those relationships. Um, creating space? Are you empowering voices? Are you listening um, to your teams or your groups that are involved to say, hey, in this situation, this time creates dialogue. Are you having dialogue like this that says, how are you guys feeling? How is our team feeling in this space? And being able to have that dialogue and having difficult conversations and checking in because that is what builds those relationships. Um, with all parties as a part of the group. As Beale said, and as Dr. Allen said, it's not a one solve all problem, but it starts that. And then one of the most important things is that they talk about in education is that relationship building. That helps to start the dialogue to learn from one another. So um, I have some other questions here is that one, it's a reflective process. So do you have, um, who is part of your leadership? as part of your organization. Is your leadership also connected to your community, as Dr. Beal said? It's not only building within the swimming pool, but building within your community. Are you building those types of relationships there? Are you organized with, um, you know, um, celebrating International Water Safety Day is a perfect chance for kids to be advocates in school, because how cool, I'll give you my example. It was very cool to see kids, you know, they're like, oh, I'm a lifeguard, um, but I never really show that at school. But on that day, they wore the sticker and it started conversations. And I heard one of the conversations in, a, in the hallway was like, oh, dude, what is that sticker for? Oh, it's for International Water Safety Day. And they're like, oh, where do you get involved? Oh, I'm on lifeguard. Oh, I don't know how to swim. Dude, you need to come to my school and let's learn how to swim. That is what that community is making that bridge from aquatics just being sold by itself to being as part of the community um, in which you are at. Um, so looking at that, looking, creating opportunities, empowering voices on your team and creating dialogue um, are some of the big things I just, just to reiterate what has been said um, as a part of it. And also does your website, does your website empower people to get information? Um, does your social media do the same thing? Um, that is important too, to make it feel inclusive. Like, oh, I see myself, as Ashira said, in your organization. Um, so are you doing that? Does everybody look the same? Do they, is it all the same thing? Being more reflective on, hey, does what we, what are we doing, practice, policy, financial, match what we are saying or what we want to do going forward? And just being reflective in that process, so. I just pulled Beal, sorry. Um, but yes, those are really good points because seeing the reflected, and I, I see someone over here is asking about like great quotes. Hannah, is it Tabor? I hope I'm saying it right. Um, but adding art or, or to our pool deck and looking for great quotes and trying to make it so it is more inclusive to people for being there. Um, Omi Dale, I hope I'm saying your name right. And if you want to unmute and ask your own question, that's fine. Otherwise, I will read it for you. But um, do yeah, you think, I can... are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry, okay, I haven't got my camera. Go ahead. I don't see um, you. But... 
speak. So yeah, my question, so I'm from the UK and I find that the conversations around increasing inclusivity and diversity in swimming are very much the same people and our training is very much, I find it inadequate in dealing with the different intersections of society. So not just getting more black swimmers, but also people with disability, um, different cultures, different religions. So I was just wondering what you guys feel about training in the US, um, because you know it's all well and good we are having these conversations, but there's many coaches, many teachers that aren't involved in these conversations and are not, you know, getting these swimmers and are missing out many, like a large part of the community because they're not necessarily aware of how to cater to these different intersections and to try to diversify their swim schools or swim clubs. So yeah, just, just a general idea on what you feel about the training um, for coaches and teachers in the US and what, could, what more could be done. Beal, is that something? I mean, I, I feel like I feel like that's a fattiest Beal intersection on like <laughs> on on like what to do because she's got a really good point there. Yes. Like, are people who are really crazy about aquatics themselves and teaching it are they equipped to deal with this? Thaddeus, you want to take that one first? <laughs> uh, there is a deficit in the full awareness of the historical impact uh, and historical trauma uh, and the lack of full education around the history of swimming and water and what it means historically. And, and I mean ancient history as well. And how did we get to where we are today? And there are um, you know, stereotypes that so many people continue to repeat uh, even if playfully, like black people don't swim, you know, black people don't swim or, you know, and also there are false beliefs that black folks also possess um, that white swimmers are superior. Even if black people can swim, whites are the best at it. They're the standard. Um, so if you're approaching uh, a swim lesson or a swimming experience with an incomplete historical awareness and context you may not be relating you're relating to the person from a stereotype or from a and they may be relating relating to the instructor so from a from a stereotype um i i just answered a question where i was talking about anxiety sensitive or trauma informed anxiety sensitive learn to swim where you come at it from the perspective of we got to stay in a playful curiosity mode. We got to uh, bring ourselves into the moment uh, and, and feel a bonding between the other participants. So we have done uh, some mindfulness and some of the breathing we just did uh, at the beginning of this webinar. Uh, we do that on the pool deck and it calms everybody down and it creates a connection you might not even be consciously aware that you're now better connected. You have more empathy. You're, you have more patience. Matter of fact, you even drop your expectation. The expectation is, I want you to be happy and calm. <laughs> I don't want you to be stressed and anxious. So it's not about learning the skill. It's about allowing someone to have a, a shift so, so in the mind-body medicine, there's something called epigenetics. And epigenetics is how genes are expressed. So if you experience a collection of trauma, you're without, without even having experienced the original trauma, generationally, it can be passed down. But it actually can be altered and shift and be expressed in another way. Being mindful and down-regulating the autonomic nervous system bringing it back into a calm of a place of balance and peace allows for, allows for a new relationship, allows for a, a, a trust and bonding, allows for enhanced self-efficacy. Yeah, I can take, I can do this. I can take care of myself. Increases curiosity, decreases apprehension, 
and fear. So I hope I answered that question. Well, what I appreciate that, Thaddeus. And I think, I think that is part of it. And I think also one of the things that everyone here is speaking to is that some of the work about the pool has to happen outside of the pool, right? So some of this work means we have to work with people and get to get into these conversations with people outside of the pool and work with them. And I, I hope that actually helps you, Omi. And I think this might actually speak a little bit to the next question that's come in from uh, Sydney. Is it DDA? If you are there, Sydney, and you want to ask your own question, I see your picture. So if you want to ask your own question, please go ahead right now. Sure. Um, it is. It's Sydney. Very nice. Well done. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm, I have an unusual situation, so I don't want to take up too much time, but I have my own lap pool at my house. And so I teach one on one individual sessions, which means that I've developed a clientele of people who have significant water trauma, people who've either had you know, experiences that were negative or who have, have generational trauma and who have, you know, a lot of fear, a lot of trepidation. We do a lot of work on anxiety and kind of working through those, the myriad issues that are there. The problem, I, I live in rural Massachusetts, Western Massachusetts, and so there's limited public pools. And again, they're in certain towns and not in others and all closed now, sadly. But um, the problem is then when they step out of my facility where they feel safe and welcomed and they've learned this great new physical skill that's benefited them emotionally and in all of these other ways, and then try to go to the YMCA where it's not as welcoming. It's not as, you know, where they don't see themselves reflected necessarily in our community. And so I'm always seeking ways that I can better help my swimmers. And, and a lot of them are adult onset. So a lot of them are people who've had, you know, a lifetime of not swimming. And now they're saying, I love this. I want to go somewhere. And they're terrified to go to the YMCA or to the public pool. And so how can I better prepare when I'm not working for one of those facilities? Yeah. my students to feel empowered in doing that. Dr. Waller, uh, do you want to speak to that one? You're on mute. mute. Does that question make sense? Dr. Dr. Mute. Your question totally makes sense, but Dr. Waller, okay. take yourself off of mute. <laughs> Dr. Waller, we can't hear you. Okay, 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 I got it. There we go. <laughs> All right, I think I'm on now. But yeah, I'm just listening to this, and I think there's there's several things that really can be points of departure. Uh, I think the big issue here is to really begin to, uh, and again, we talked about this earlier, holding these meaningful conversations around those topical areas. Um, the other thing that I would suggest is, you know, really this is a question of policy. Mm -hmm. um, I would certainly begin to gather folks to form coalitions to put pressure back on folks that are owners and operators of those facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, some of what you're talking about, particularly in public spaces, are violations of state and federal law and local ordinances. Now remember, those are your tax dollars that are supporting those particular facilities and the people that work there. Uh, the unfortunate part about it is that people typically don't stand up to that challenge mm -hmm. of calling people out. Um, you know, again, I, I was thinking about, um, this whole situation over in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And a wonderful lady I met, whose name is Marva Reed, who really ended up pummeling city government and, <laughs> into building a brand new complex over there. Now again, as we've said earlier, nothing happens overnight. It takes time, it takes effort. Uh, but I think in this particular case, you know, we're talking about advocacy, uh, aggressive ag advocacy, and activism for all intents and purposes. Um, again, having worked on the other side of the aisle for 25 years, um, you count on people not showing up and not saying anything. Y you know, um, I mean, I look at it in my own career. I have demolished swimming complexes, but then again, I've built other ones simply because of the fact that at those public hearings, nobody's gonna show. Mm -hmm. 
particularly from communities that are adversely impacted. And I think in this era, people count on that. Uh, remember, politics, policy, and budget, and law are all tied together. And they really undergird much of what we um, can make happen, but also what we let happen. So I don't know whether that's helpful to you or not, but that's a perspective. It makes sense though, because that's why I toss to you, Dr. Wallace, because you have experience being on that other side. You know what it's like. And I think, think about the neighborhoods where it's like no parking on these streets at all. You can never park here. Why? That's because people were at those meetings making sure and they did not want people there. Or when the speed bump pops up, it's because people were there in those meetings saying they're driving too fast and my children live here, right? Yeah. This is because you need to have that advocacy and that hasn't been there. And, and, and you're right, it's in a safe space with Sydney. If she's there and they can come to her and her house behind, safe. But when they go out and people are watching them, it's kind of like the first time, you know, you go to a gym for a lot of people, they feel like, look, I'm like haji podgy body size and they're gonna look at me and judge because I don't know how much weight I should put on. It's all that sort of, you know, all of that. People feel like they're being judged and it is uncomfortable. But the only way this changes is if you have more people behind you. Um, I want to move on to Michael Switalski. I hope I said your name right. I'm trying to make sure I've said everyone's name. I see you there, Buffalo City Swim Racers. Um, if you want to unmute and ask your question here, um, that's cool. Or if you just want me to do it, just point at me and I'll do it. Oh, you unmuted. Go ahead. Sure. So obviously I'm in Buffalo, New York. Um, I'm a urban physical education teacher as well as obviously running the Buffalo City Swim Racers. Those that know me, I'm a strong advocate for access and opportunity for all. Um, I guess the, the big thing that I notice in my community lately is that there is a greater focus on building splash pads in our black community instead of swimming pools. Um, we do have two indoor public pools both are in predominantly white communities of the city of Buffalo. Uh, outdoor pools are very limited in nature. So I was just wondering if there's any study that's ever been conducted. Madam Chair is. Somebody is not muted. If you could mute yourself so we could listen to Michael. Thank you. So I was just wondering if there's ever been any study to do a comparison between swimmer density with registrations from USA Swimming ethnic density in our communities uh, and the accessibility of pools in those communities. That sounds like a Beal topic. Hi, Beal. Or Waller, or Waller. <laughs> I know it's both, but I, I was going to you. Uh, okay, so uh, we'll actually, uh, the, the, those are actually three different areas um, that could, could definitely be addressed within in terms of the studies of those, in terms of quality. Right now, um, in terms of some of this, uh, the studies, as we said, with um, USA Swimming, and we would defer um, to, to some of the most um, stringent ones are, are mostly focused on, on the drowning um, by the Irwins and, and their colleagues that are you know, awesome in that. I think um, some currently, um, and what I would like to do is, Michael, if you would, um, to have more discussion specifically for this, because right now I, I'd like, because that's a much more specific, I actually have to go and do research on it to give an informed response. And that is what I would prefer to do. I would not go beyond it. But um, there are a couple of things that actually could go uh, to for in terms of like Om Omi's, I, and I don't know her question from the UK, as well as this one. Certain things in terms of, uh, one of the things diversity in aquatics is when we're talking about advocacy, we are, advoc um, we are actually um, looking at, we have, one of the things we have done is looked at, um, looking at how currently when you're talking about splash pads and everything else, what cities are doing, are they are building those to address, right, the drowning rate and to decrease that in urban areas. But then also some of the things they're doing is also, if, if you know in some of your local pools, they're also changing the depth of the pools. Right, so pools now, you might have a, a hard time finding city pools with, um, with depths, right? 12, de even for, for tr uh, training, um, in terms of lifeguard training. Um, so a, a, a few things that, that cross um, in that, what we, in order to look at that, that goes back to what Dr. Waller was saying. 
policy and advocacy in your area will be some of the first things that we where we would have to start and look at to really discuss is it a problem or is it something that the communities wanted right so then um because the reality is is, is as you're you're also you know looking at it um there are a lot of also policies with regard to life jacket use that you all might also might have seen popping up in cities around the country, which also kind of target that that drowning uh, rate. But in terms of some of the splash pads here in Philadelphia, the same thing is, is going on. But it has been what that what the, those who have actually gone into when we're talking about to advocate for infrastructural change. Those were who, that's who was at the table at the time. So it wasn't that it, it was not wanted, but if, the, if, if who is at the table at the time making policy, making changes, looking at the tax dollars is really what the, is the loudest voice. One of the things that I've been striving for here and, 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 and I would love in health and physical education, looking at one of the key things Dr. Waller talks about, that multi-sectoral approach. How can we together, here at Diversity and Aquatics, we're trying to do that. We are we are reaching out and working on it. You said yeah, it coaching and training, you are correct, is not adequate. We do have, for example, a teaching for personal and social responsibility model that we have studied in an aquatic area um, to show that there is a difference with utilizing a, health, a, a social emotional curricular model to actually teaching and training lifeguards that has, has been set with K through 12 occupational standards and been successful and then transferred out into things like occupational opportunities, which sometimes impact communities and competitive swimming. So I would invite you to the table to really, you know, tweak more out on that um, because it's very interesting. And then here at Diversity and Aquatics, we have an adapted aquatics council. And I see some of our members, Dr. Monica Laporte is a lead expert in that area. Who, who works with children of varying abilities and has had years of expertise in that. That's a part of, of, of the diversity and aquatics um, element to, to really try. And, and so these are conversations that, as you said, this, these, a lot of the questions we're talking about are going to take a multi-sectoral approach, addressing policy, addressing, when we are looking at some of the national partners, guess where they are? They are also at Congress with lobbyists. We cannot afford to do that. So how do we work together to come to the table from, because one of the things we really do, if we talk about, a so, about the theoretical model that guides diversity in aquatics, it's a social ecological model that also looks at the constraints that are part of that. And so what that means is it starts with that individual because that's where we, we are. But when we're talking about diverse communities in terms of race, ability, I mean, diversity, before we can get to that actual center, these are a variety of avenues that we do need to advocate for to make the changes that we are really looking at that get to those, those national levels. And that's really, when we say we are action-based, our, our principles are to educate, empower, right? And that, that's our goal. And, and so because everybody is distinctly different, different and your needs are different, the goal is to really try to understand it in your communities. Maybe it's time for you to get to know your policymakers. If you're at a, um, a in, in terms of a, a team, look at how you're involving parents in communities, right? So. It, we can share that social, if you aren't familiar with it, the social ecological model really is key and, and that's what we're looking for. And that's what it's gonna take for all of us in our unique individual places. We have, I mean, and that's what, what you can see. And, and of those of you who are actually, I see, have had the opportunity to see some of you on the call, Diversity in Aquatics is a great time to build networks because there are people down in Miami. I've seen Bridget, hey doing great work down there, K through 12, with, with Thaddeus doing great work with, we're across the globe, but this is the kind of effort it's gonna to take to create change. Bill, thank you. Um, and just to that point, Michael, if you are not already connected with the diversity and aquatics folks, I would urge you to do that so that Beal can answer your questions and help you because all of this information, yes, the cool thing is that you people who are practically out there 
working with people swimming, but there's also people on the academic side. These guys have all had like a ton of degrees. I, I got one degree and I stopped. But these guys have a lot of degrees. And so they have a lot of studying that they've done on this and information that they can share. So I would just urge you and many others to do that. Um, one other thing before I go to Dr. Waller to talk a little bit about Winston Waterworks, because we're, we're already running out of time and I want to make sure we get to all of your questions. Um, I see that Hannah Tabor is still looking for quotes. So anybody has a good quote for her wall? Think about it. Write it into the group chat there so she can see it. Uh, but Dr. Waller, go ahead and uh, tell us a bit more about Winston Waterworks, which you mentioned earlier. And unmute yourself. Thank you for the <laughs> heads up. You know, again, I'm, I was listening to Michael's question. Um, and, and one thing I would say to you is that, you know, one, one, of, one, of the, one of the big issues I think we've got to come to terms with is it's one thing to be at the table, but it's another thing to be at the right table. All too often, we are at the wrong tables. We show up at budget hearings. We show up uh, you know, at uh, e election events, and we're yelling and screaming at people, or we're demanding things. But the place that we seldom show up are at city planning meetings. That's where all your decisions are made. Nothing, I don't care how much money you put underneath a project or an idea, it goes no place until it gets out of the planning unit. That can be with the city, that can be a regional planning authority, something as simple as putting in a splash pad. Uh, that idea is anchored in a plan someplace. And there are seven to nine people that sit on a rostrum and they approve those plans one way or another, but they are looking for your feedback. So I think part of the intelligence is learning where to be with, with folks and making the right kinds of um, decisions. And I think, again, when we look at this, um, this whole matter of the Winston Waterworks and Winston-Salem, North Carolina, I see we see a really incredible conversion, or convergence, I should say, of law, policy, activism, advocacy, um, which really forced the hand of city government there to build that Winston Waterworks project. Again, I uh, had the great pleasure of chatting with Marva Reed a lot um, over the last five, six months, and actually had a chance to go down over last summer and visit that particular facility. Beautiful facility, uh, about $1.75 to $2 million. Uh, but the bottom line is that project came about uh, as a result of actions that were actually done in the 1970s and 80s to really decimate that community, strip it of its recreational resources, inclusive of swimming pools, under the guise of urban renewal. Now, the inherent problem is, once we start knocking things down, again, planning comes into play, and somebody has to say and remind folks, you need to put these back. And unfortunately, when we don't do that, we see these great gaps in the uh, recreation and sport infrastructure uh, of an entire facility cities. But fortunately, there are some people that hang around in neighborhoods long enough uh, to have public memory. And public memory can be a powerful tool, particularly if you began swimming in a certain facility in a certain neighborhood uh, X number of years ago, and you remember the public health value, also the criminal justice value. Uh, swimming can also be a very powerful deterrent. Uh, to aberrant behaviors. But the bottom line is what they ended up doing was uh, working in tandem uh, with a, just not, a, not all of the city council, uh, but just one or two members there uh, to really force some key votes. Uh, one of the big votes had to do with a, a milli or a, a levy that the city needs to get, needed to get passed. And subsequently, um, Marva Reed working in tandem with Derwin Montgomery, who at that point was the, I do, do believe, the president of the city council, ended up getting a large millage pass or levy. And in that levy was the construction of not only the Winston Waterworks project, but monies that could be used to begin to restore pools that were decimated uh, in the decades of the 80s and the 90s. So subsequently, again, what you have is a model of citizen engagement, activism, advocacy, 
law and policy coming together uh, to put together some of the resources that got torn down in those decades. And, and I think, um, you know, if you look at the paper, the paper really doesn't do what happened justice. Uh, matter of fact, my colleagues and I are writing this in three installments uh, because there, there are two other narratives that need to be shared. Uh, one, how after pressure, uh, the city will come to bear and begin to give resources uh, they can swear they don't have. But ultimately, when the right people are pushing the right buttons on election day, uh, things begin to turn around very quickly. But the bottom line is, I think, again, you can have those meaningful convergences when people begin to coalesce, uh, take that multi-sectoral approach uh, to wrestling with aquatic space issues. Dr. Waller, thank you so much for giving us that, <laughs> just showing us in action what we've been talking about here. Um, we're at 3.30 already. Well, I'm in California, so 6.30. Um, but I want to go to Andrea McPike. If you are here and you want to ask your own question, you can unmute yourself. There you are. I see you. Would you Hi. like to ask your question? Yeah, I can. Um, so I work for a swim school called Big Blue Swim School. Um, we're based in Chicago, but starting to franchise. Um, so we're opening our first pool in uh, Johns Creek, Atlanta on Monday, actually. Um, so it'll be our first school outside of Chicago, which is exciting. Um, but my question is, you know, we I think in light of this, obviously, you're just starting to think about what our role is in helping to get more kids you know, from black and brown communities that are learning to swim at a younger age. And I think initially the conversation started with, you know, how do we partner with nonprofits that might allow us to offer, you know, free or discounted swim lessons. But I think, you know, Dr. Allen made such a good point earlier, just, you know, the risk of there not being kind of the, the participation levels you would like simply just due to kind of the lack of awareness around the importance of swimming or just, you know, lack of, I guess, ability of the parents to swim and therefore, you know, not, not wanting their kids to be involved. And so long-winded way to ask just, you know, how have others thought about approaching either, you know, from like a trust building perspective with parents or even just engaging with other communities that might um, help us with our mission of, you know, in, engaging with kids at a young age to get them to learn to swim. And at the young age is so important, it really helps. And uh, Beal, even though it says Dante Tafik. <laughs> <laughs> um, Angela, would you like to address that? Well, well um, first and foremost, uh, thank you so much for your question. Um, one of the things is, that I want everyone to remember is, is that each of you are in diverse communities that has diverse stakeholders that come to the table. Um, one of, of the, the uh, automatic things that we would know is that diversity in aquatics also has built um, collaborative, collaborative relationships with national organizations. And if you hadn't been aware of some, for example, the American Red Cross had their centennial campaign swimming programs. And that's been over uh, actually uh, now seven years where they've gone into communities um, and, and I'm out in terms of centennial programming, to work with communities. So that actually might be something that I would check for immediately in your community about how you might build a bridge if you have, for example, uh, you know, th that connection or even becoming familiar with that, that opportunity is one. Um, uh, because the reality is getting to know your stakeholders and your community and building collaboratives, but we have partners. There are national partners who sometimes, as it, I think the, the, it's systemic, we aren't really in touch with each other to know. Everyone is doing it on their own. Diversity in Aquatics looks at it as an umbrella of, of an umbrella under which our members argue what makes us strong is the unique individuals doing the work, just like you out there in the field and meeting each other in it. But also understanding that we also reach out and work and, and want to build that that connection with organizations that are at a larger level, not our mom and pops, right? To make that policy change. Diversity and Aquatics first came to the table with a, with a congressional resolution in 2015, did I get it right, 15? 
Oh, no, 10. Oh my gosh, I'm old now. 2010, I can't remember. The memory goes first. But at that table, and you, you wouldn't even understand, you, you might not understand, it was the first time that partners in aquatics came together to really look at uh, addressing this issue. So, or this matter, the importance. And so what diversity in aquatics since 2010 has been striving to do is to make, build those bridges, understanding that those are the higher bridges, but we have to, when you're working with diverse communities, as we said, Native American communities. When you're talking about, um, it might be a Vietnamese communities. In Seattle, Dr. Kwan shares great literature in, in, about programs going on out there. It's about getting to know the stakeholders, the aquatic stakeholders. And remember, how do you define stakeholders? Oftentimes people just stop with the people who are talking about aquatics. But what we're saying is invite educators, invite parents, invite Look at what national organizations are there. If you are at your Y, there's an aquatic director that has policies or, or, or there are, might be programs in your cities that you didn't know had community connections that you could actually connect with. And, and that is what we strive to do at Diversity in Aquatics is to connect, but also we're looking for accountability also. So it, it's not easy. Diversity in aquatics didn't just pop up, and it's not just about one, one element because we can't just look at one thing. We can't just say it is this, but our goal is to make change agents where you are to create the changes you seek, but you do have to come outside the pool. Yeah, a lot yeah. of it is outside the pool, right? And mm -hmm. I love the fact that if you're Andrea, I hope I said your name right, Andrea, Andrea. Um, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Andrea. Okay, but I love the fact that you're asking that question on like how to make this engagement happen. Uh, Ashira, I thought that this might be something that you wanted to add to, and I know Thaddeus, you do too. Um, I just want to ask you both to keep your question, your answers a little short, so I can try to get to a couple more questions as we are getting to the end here. Okay. Um, I was just, for me, I think that um, it's. I always look at things from that systematic lens, but. Like getting like one idea I had was like getting the parents involved or some because a lot of times again like parents may not know how to swim. I've taught many swim lessons where parents were so nervous sitting on the side. I'm like, hold on. And I was like, well, you know, getting them involved, like maybe having a like a combination where the parents are involved with the swim lessons and they can they can see and and then education and exposure to um, you know, how because there are a lot of barriers when it comes to uh, like the black community and, and again like I spoke to before when it came to wealth and and money and access and stuff and so um, just understanding you know maybe you have speakers that can or a beautician that can come and say hey you know this is how you can have a protective style on your hair or oh I I know that there are you know swimsuits for you know training that are like thirty dollars on Amazon I don't know you know so like real life solutions to problems that they, they may be having because a lot of times it's like, you know, my child, I just got my, for example, I just got my child's hair done yesterday. I don't want them to get it wet. And so, you know, I paid for that. Like, how can they, how can solutions to those real life everyday problems that they are dealing with on an everyday basis be addressed? And so I think be bringing other people that they may be able to relate to or, um, you know, can see themselves in and to help address those problems may be a solution. Um, that's just one example. but. Thank you, Dr. Allen. That's awesome. Uh, Thaddeus, you want to add quickly to this too? Sure. Um, become the change you want to see. Be the authentic human being. Don't shy away from the history. And this is the history. Can you see this? That's a fact. And we're living the legacy of that. Become that courageous individual who will speak the truth about how we got here. Absolutely. Uh, thanks for that, Thaddeus. Um, I also see in here, there's been a couple of questions and references that to the, this historical context and that a lot of people don't know it and that it's 
you know, that they don't understand that this history is there. And I see a lot of you shaking your heads kind of like, yeah, I didn't realize how pervasive it was throughout the country. And so just wondering if there's a place where they can find more information about that. And if anyone here has information, you know, feel free to drop it into the chat so that we can have it, we can have it there as well. Um, you know, as we're getting here, I want to go to uh, one Nicholas Askew, who uh, is the head coach of the swim program at Howard University. Um, full disclosure, his brother was the captain of the swim team when I joined. Um, and his older brother is also really good friends. I've, these guys are like brothers to me. But um, the reason why we're talking to Nick today right now is because of what uh, he and, and his team, what they are planning to do and, and more about that. So Nick, if you can unmute yourself and speak for a little bit. And thanks, Steph. I appreciate it so much. Um, you know, I'm just grateful to be listening into this very important conversation and having so much engagement from the entire community. I think the, this is just, it's awesome to see. And, um, you know, I'm just, I continue, I'm continually to take notes about different things that um, I'm talking towards uh, to everyone I come in contact with. And um, for, for those of you that don't know, Howard University is located in Washington, D.C., the nation's capital. And our swimming and diving program is the only HBCU uh, currently left that has a swimming and diving program. And uh, we've competed with pride and honor for uh, since the early 1900s. And uh, our program is uh, doing so many different things currently. And I'm so proud of the young men and young women that are, are, that are part of our program. Uh, they have been on the front lines uh, with activism and protests and organizing uh, within even our recruits have been uh, organizing protests and conversations at their high schools. And um, that's just something that really warms my heart as the as a coach for the program. Um, one of the things that, that we've been talking about with our team currently is what can we do? What is something that we can use our platform for doing right now? We've uh, we very proudly have been able to be a representation um, at the NCAA level um, of, of athletes of color um, and what a program looks like uh, at an elite level for competitive swimming as a whole. Um, one of the things that we're doing coming up and we're going to be un unrolling this on Friday, which is, the which is Juneteenth, the anniversary of ending slavery, um, is we're launching an initiative called No Cap hands up. And for many of you that may not know, no cap is a, a colloquialism for, for the, the younger generation. It basically means in all seriousness. And we're using that uh, imagery and that wording in our, and for us as swimmers to uh, you know, you take this opportunity to encourage everyone in the aquatic community to stand in solidarity against systemic racism, police brutality, social injustice, environmental and health disparities uh, and educational inequalities. And what we're asking is for everyone in the aquatic community, uh, whether it be swimming, diving, age group, masters, synchro, crew, anything in that community, in that realm, all of the coaches, all of the athletes, parents, anyone who uh, is willing to participate to um, essentially join us in this movement um, and saying no cap hands up uh, we're going to be launching it on our social media page on friday and uh, we're, we're again we're just calling for everyone to join us throughout the the aquatic community and just showing their solidarity with us saying no cap hands up that's awesome and you know i also would say about Nick, because I see the activity on Facebook, even though I don't always comment because I may be in the middle of doing something, but I do see all the activity. One of the things that Nick has been able to do as the last university with an, you know, HBCU with a swim program is he keeps people engaged. He's found ways to make people want to come to the pool, um, making sure that they're, they're seeing swimming in a different way. I mean, you've even had music there, right, Nick? So can you, can you talk a little bit, some of the ideas that you've done to keep people interested? Because, you know, we would talk about when we were in, in college, our swimsuits would be barely basically see-through and the basketball team would get new shoes each game, right? So it was like, <laughs> they were not trying to fund us. We were like, but, but, but. So Nick, talk about some of the things that you're doing to keep people engaged. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity. I think, um, you know, part of my recruiting speech when I have uh, young men and young women come with their parents and families, and it's, I'm very open. Uh, I grew up in age group swimming in North Carolina. Um, as, as, as Steph mentioned, my two older brothers swam. Um, so I, I've been around the swimming world for, for a good amount of time. And I recognize that unless you're a swimmer or a swim parent, swimming is boring. Swim meets are boring, um, especially in this day and age when uh, you have technology right at your hands, whether it be an iPad or a phone, you, you're just easily distracted by it. So some of the ways we've tried to draw a support base in with fans to our, to our home meets, especially as we have an on-deck DJ at every single meet. And that on-deck DJ is spinning music from every single generation to keep the energy and the meet going. Because I'm, let's be truthful and honest, for those of you that have been to a swim meet, when you're watching, you know, a thousand uh, especially in age group swimming or 500, that's usually time to take a break, you know, or whatnot. But the, having that music and that energy there, it really keeps the crowd engaged, as well as having an opportunity for the team to feed off of that energy. And now all of a sudden it becomes more exciting. And I know there's a, there are limitations with age group swimming and as, as well as there are in NCAA, but I think it's time to come to the table and really have those conversations about, you know, what can we, what and when and what space can we create some of those other things? Um, we've, we've continued to do support for outside organizations. So we've had other teams and other organizations, they're the key people within the community be invited to our meets. Um, something that we've, we've had happen is we've had uh, the president of the university or the provost of the university or the council member from, the, uh, from Washington DC in that state and, and our, uh, or one of the council members be honorary on deck coaches for the swim meet. And again, it just draws them in because if they can see and they be a part of what's going on, they're gonna be more invested and they're actually gonna, they've been shown to be more supportive. And what I love about that too, Nick, is the idea of thinking outside the box. And I can compare it to in Olympics, the idea of uh, the floor exercises for gymnastics. Remember when they were just doing, you had to have music and it couldn't have any words and it was all like classical music. And then they changed it and said, you could have lyrics. And then you started seeing these performances go viral, right? Like she's dancing to Michael Jackson, she's dancing. And you saw the fact that because they made this change and adapted to this new time we're in, more people were engaged, more people are like, oh, that's amazing. And so I think that's something for all of us to consider when looking at diversity in aquatics is how to adapt your environment in a way that is modern, but also speaks to the people you are trying to draw in. Not alienating people, but bringing people together. You don't want to alienate um, at all when it comes to this. Um, Miriam, do you want to add a little bit to that? Mute, mute, mute. There. It's the curse of, uh, but uh, that's why it's important to have different stakeholders as a part of your organization so that you do have that out of the box um, thinking. I mean, look towards your athletes too. Um, the youth are, one thing I know is working with Howard and working with Coach Nick and being a teacher, the youth are the voice. They're gonna be the ones to say, hey, this is how, what's cool, what's, what's gonna be engaging and, and creating that vulnerability as a leader um, to be able to say, I don't have all the answers. Um, that's what the best thing a part of us is a diversity in aquatics. We don't have the an all the answers, but our membership is what feeds us. Um, you guys in this discussion is what feeds us into being able to address those spaces. And we do the same thing with our athletes, right? Our athletes are going to tell us, our parents are going to tell us, our community are going to tell us like, hey, we have this and uh, we think it'd be cool to do, to do X, Y, and Z um, and trying. And it's okay to, to fail. Um, you, you're going to learn. Failing is learning in that space. So being able to try, listen, fail, try it again. And just because it doesn't work once, try it more times. So um, I, I would add that to, to that space because I've seen the most successful programs that have done that, have said, you know, let's, we want to do this. Let's bring people to the table. Let's try it and let's make it better each time. And, you know, we have a few minutes here, so if there's a couple more questions you want to ask, we can get to it, um, just because I want to make sure we don't alienate anyone who's here. I mean, how often do we get to do this, right? So we should, we should take advantage of this and, and answer those questions that you may have. Um, 
because I realized too that this is sort of a new beginning for some people. It's like, how do I get in here? And you're here, you're present. So you've already made the first step of being here um, and talking to this a bit. Um, one of the things that has struck me while we've been having this conversation is Ashira, because Ashira did not go through the whole like college swimming program. She just loves the water. And I imagine for most of us, those are the people we're encountering. It's like, listen, I don't know. I just like it. I just, I just like being in the water. You know, my friends, they joke about it all the time. Cause whenever we go on a vacation, I'm like in and out the water. And like, it, it is, I've been swimming since I was so little that I don't remember learning to swim. And I uh, felt that way very much about my daughter, who's now 10, who was swimming at like three. These are things that you just need to get in root. And so now when she gets in the pool, it's just normal. There's no, there's no thinking about it, really. It's just like that. You know how for swimmers, you don't think about like holding your breath. You just do it. You don't, you don't even think about it. It's just second nature. And that's kind of the same idea that we're looking for with diversity and aquatics, that this, this idea that we can share the space together and learn that it's not detracting from any group. It actually makes it better for everyone if we're participating in water safety and water sports. It just, it, in, it increases it so much for everyone. Um, and that's one of the things that has really attracted me to what we've been doing here at Diversity and Aquatics is the fact that, you know, Miriam and Beal early on and Thaddeus and Dr. Waller and, and Ashira have assembled these people who've come they have threads that are in common, but they come from different worlds and they're able to share that knowledge. And that's what we see in all of you. All of you have this different knowledge. And as, as Beale was saying, those barriers that like everyone's doing it in their own silos, putting it under one umbrella um, really does help. Um, Rory Southworth, if you are wanting to ask your question, because I don't see you right now, I'm looking for you. If not, I can just ask the question for you. But Rory is, Rory, if you're there, speak up and I will stop talking. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Hi, Rory. Go ahead and ask your question. Hi there. Uh, also from the UK. Um, so I run a uh, project that helps get kit to uh, BAME outdoor community leaders. So they have a kit store of um, trainers and backpacks and waterproofs that they can then lend out to people who are just starting to get into this sort of sports, things like climbing, hiking, gill scrambling. How much of um, a barrier to adoption is, is the cost of equipment to the swim world? Like where, you know, some people don't have pool boys or swim wetsuits for open water swimming, things like that. You know, is that, is that something that needs to be focused on or, yeah, how much of that, of that is a problem? Yeah, I mean, Ashira, I feel like that probably speaks to something that you've been, you've been doing. Thank you for your question, Rory. Ashira, do you want to speak to that? Uh, but you're on mute. There you go. Um, I, so again, I, I have, I would need to like the research part of it, like has there been studies on, but from a personal perspective, I, there, that is a barrier. Um, again, like swimsuits and again, especially like if you're swimming on a regular basis, like the deterioration of the swimsuits, you have to buy them on a, you know, on a regular basis. So it can be a barrier to, um, someone participating in those uh, um, activities. I'm um, going and purchasing your own uh, kickboard and pool buoy and your swim bag and your goggles and swim caps and all of that. And, and it just adds up. And so again, I think that it would be important for everyone to do some studying about just the systemic structure and, and the wealth gap and understanding where people may be coming from when it comes to you know these certain communities, because people you know it's like like should I buy this swimsuit or should I buy shoes for them to go to school? Should I, you know, do I, I spent two hundred dollars on getting her hair braided? This needs to last two months. If she goes swimming, it's only going to last three weeks, you know. And so I think understanding that those cultural dynamics and really understanding you know the economic portion of it and how you know, people may just not be able to invest in that, even though they may be wanting to and may have a desire to, um, that is definitely a barrier. It's very real. So, But uh, we also have, and, and Rory, for example, uh, Thaddeus uh, is also a, a master uh, swimmer, but also a triathlete. 
So in the sense of talking about the exposure or how you introduce that is also important. And then once again, building collaborations with how you might be able to share and gather equipment. But um, as we know, open water drowning also disproportionately impacts diverse populations also. Open water, you know, as it's reported. So becoming aware of the environment. So how would you approach that? So what is the knowledge, you know, just the natural knowledge base around that? And then introducing, if you're introducing the sport, when you're talking about open water swimming, depending on if you're talking about wetsuits, right? If you're talking about the training part. So that's two different facets. And if you look at the budgetary element, for example, bet be between being a triathlete, as well as now, you know, being a swimmer, there, they, you know, are a combination of things, but, but really sharing resources, building relationships, looking at um, how uh, programs could, could partner. So for example, we have the National Drowning Prevention Alliance and, and other members. So building collaboration for us is very important. And then showing how that can really make a difference in a community's life. Um, I was thinking something else that Tasha Quash just put in here as well, is that sometimes you may have the swimsuit that maybe you go, you know, in the beginning, you're just learning you got your swimsuit from Marshalls or Ross or someplace, right? You get yourself a discounted swimsuit so you just can get in the pool. Start there, right? I may or may not have done that after covering a hurricane and it, the waves were really good in North Carolina and I went and bought a cheap swimsuit so I could swim. So I may or may not have done that. So just saying, it works. Um, but part of the issue is also just getting sometimes to the pool if the pool is far away, right? So that is part of the cost. How are they getting there? How many, you know, do you have to take the metro and the train? And like, what does that cost? Um, because that can be part of the expense too. If the pool does not offer the kickboards and the flippers and uh, the pool boys and, you know, buoy, the, all of that stuff, if that's not there, then that can become very expensive. Um, it's not just buying a swimsuit, right, and a swim cap. It becomes more and more and more and more. Um, so listen, we are coming up to the end. Miriam, I feel like, I feel like you, you're shaking your hand like you have something to say, so I want you to speak. Real quick, um, this idea came from Arthur Lopez. He's one of our board members. Uh, he is a professor at Indiana University, Bloomington. And um, something that he said he did is he went around to get swimsuits um, he didn't ask the kids to come ready. He actually went to partner with local swim shops and even with marshals and stuff and said, hey, give me all your, dis all your things that you're about to send back and or that are going out of inventory or that are left over and let me and use that as a do your inventory as donations to our organization. He didn't ask for money. He asked for donations in things. So just something to take away too is to create that, um, to reduce that barrier to entry in, into the field because um, I know, yeah, I know Thaddeus, you said something real quick. Thaddeus, go for it. Um, the not, when, when you get outside of the traditional learn to swim, swim club community like triathlon and surfing, they, surfing actually has deeper pockets. So we do a program here in South Florida called Street Waves. And if you connect to the surfing community, they've donated surfboards, uh, sweatsuits, Mm -hmm. And if you approach it from a, a, another angle, you know, especially if you're working in open water, Rory, I think you, you met, it looks like you might be you asked about web suits, unless it's just really cold in the UK when, <laughs> when you get in the pool. But uh, the non-traditional um, uh, aquatic sports may be able to help in, 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 if, you, if you access them, like the surfing community. Surfing is now an Olympic sport. And I love the idea of, again, it is called diversity in aquatics for a reason, because A, we don't just mean black people, and B, we don't just mean swimming. <laughs> we mean all kinds of water, and we mean people coming from many different places. And maybe it's about their physicality. Maybe it's about, um, you know, uh, what kind of sport that they're interested in. It could be a, many, a myriad of things that we're talking about here, and there's a reason why that we have it structured that way. So that is a great point, Thaddeus, of getting into the water through different ways. Here, we go out to the marina sometimes with my daughter and we will go kayaking, um, just other little fun things that we can do. Um, Martha Fowler, if you have something to say, we're coming up to the end here, but you can yeah, just go ahead and do just it. It's very quick, yeah, that, uh, that's a big challenge. I have a program 
Um, I'm, as you know, I'm part of the diversity in aquatics and one of the consoles in the Latino outreach. And yes, they are always usually don't come to the pool because they also have to add the cost of the class, but they add the, of the cost of equipment. So we had uh, an event um, at the local church, uh, ch uh, uh, swim um, uh, park here. And uh, I use a lot of the caps that triathletes, my triathlete friends from a triathlon group gave me because after the races they get a cap and they get they sometimes they keep them and they go they get bushy and ugly or they could do something with them so they gave me used goggles and used caps gently used caps and we can reuse that for the kids or other adults so especially when an adult wants to learn to swim don't give them any kind of barriers just give them the cap even if it's used they'd appreciate that Nice point. And, and I do a, an event in uh, Mexico where we teach 100 kids how to be safe in water once a year. Yeah. That is, that's actually a great tip too in finding ways around it. And that's one last thing I will say about this is that all of these little tidbits, all of this is sprinkled out, all of this you know, knowledge that you all have, all you've experienced, let's bring this together. And that's what diversity in aquatics really wants to do. Um, so. I am so glad that you've all been here. I hope that this has been useful. I hope that it was a, a beneficial two hours uh, that you were able to get some information here and we could answer some of your questions. I see a few of you have asked about joining and the link seems to be having an issue. We will get that straight. If you want to just message me um, privately with your contact information, I will make sure that we get it on so that you can be, become a member of Diversity in Aquatics. Just send me a direct message uh, privately and I will go ahead and if you don't want to send it out to the whole group, which I get, um, and we'll make sure that we get it to the right people. So feel free to do that. We definitely want your engagement. We want you involved. Um, and then I'm going to just toss it to Miriam who has a couple of points about next events so we can keep you guys engaged with us. But again, thank you so much for being here with us today. We really, really are glad you're here. Miriam? Yes. So thank you, Stephanie, and thank you all. Just real quick, we have a couple of events that are coming up that we want you to be engaged with them. We will put into our email back to you. One is on June 28th, we're having a session called Let's Talk, and it's an athlete discussion on race, social justice, and aquatics. We've teamed up with another organization, um, Youth Empowerment, um, Voice of Youth Empowerment, and we're working with them um, to create a space, a safe space for athletes um, to be able to talk about what it is that this, this time period brings. In addition, um, one of our partners with the American Red Cross in July, we are teaming up with them to talk about COVID-19, the re-entry, water safety, um, and water safety resources. Um, for you to be able to have and also the partnership that we've been able to work with them on is with the National Diverse Partnership Alliance, which they are, they have been instrumental in the last four or five years with us in bringing organizations that are not aquatic based into the aquatic base. Um, and so that means like uh, Boys and Girls Club, Jack and Jill of America. Um, and more, uh, several fraternities and sororities also into that space. Um, so we're gonna talk more about that in July. And then also um, Thaddeus is going more in depth in July to talk about mind, body, medicine and trauma informed approach to adult learn to swim. So just wanted to give you that as what's happening uh, th the rest of this month into next month. We hope you guys will stay engaged. We are very sorry that we got capped at 100. Um, we will fix that. Um, some people gave some re great resources for us to make sure and fix it. And we're learning too. Please understand, um, we are learning and growing in this space. Um, and so uh, we thank you for your patience. We thank you for being here. We thank you for um, furthering on the cause of what we have been, we're, we're all working towards. Oh. Yes, indeed. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm going to, I would like to leave the conversation up so I can save everyone's messages over here who's messaging me, but everyone else, thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you at the next one. Okay. Bye everyone. Thanks for being here.